Hello and welcome to The Rules of Fun, the show where myself, the madcap gamer, will go through all those annoying rules and facets of games so that you, the player, do not have to. Today we are reviewing Gibson's 221 Baker Street, the Sherlock Holmes master detective game where you will pit your wits against a series of clues to see which of you can be first to solve the case. 221B Baker Street is a murder mystery game where you play the role of Sherlock Holmes solving cases that come to his attention at 221B Baker Street. Now this game is for 2-6 to six players from ages 10 up and takes about an hour to an hour and a half per case if you play with the basic rules. Now there are three alternative ways to play this game, some of which speed up the game immensely. I played the cooperative version of this game with two friends of mine recently and that only took us 20 to 25 minutes to get through. Now the style of gameplay to 221B Baker Street will be familiar to those of you that have played Cluedo or Clue for our American friends before in so much as you will take your playing piece which starts of course at 221B Baker Street and move around the city of London looking for clues in different locations. Now the thing that sets this game apart from other games like Cluedo is its replayability. Now there are not only 75 individual cases to be solved, all with their own rich characters and details, but there are also three different game modes to play this game in. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but first, let's get on to the rules. Now what each player will need in order to play 221B Baker Street is access to the rulebook, their own individual solutions checklist card, the case card which can be read and reread at any stage by anyone during the game, a skeleton key, a Scotland Yard badge, and their own individual meeple Sherlock Holmes to move around the board. First and foremost, select how many players you have and place them on the board at 221B Baker Street. Issue each player a Scotland Yard badge and a master key or skeleton key. Next they will need a solutions checklist. Now each individual game will require each player to have their own fresh checklist. So if you want to use pencil or something like that or one of those erasable pens so you don't go through as many pieces of paper, that might be a good idea. Lastly, in order to kick off the game, one of the players, it doesn't matter which, is going to read through the case. The case will have a number, for instance case number one, the adventure of the unholy man, and the player's job is to read through all of the clues as they stand as if the case was handed directly to Sherlock Holmes. At the bottom of these cases, it will tell you what you are looking for with regards to clues for the case. For instance, Scotland Yard in this particular case, which is the first case of the game, wants to know who killed the person, the weapon used, and the motive. Which means you are looking for three clues as you go around the board. Now you're ready to start the game and all you have to do is simply roll your dice and move your Sherlock Holmes figure that many spaces along the path. Just like Cluedo, once you have moved far enough in order to get your Sherlock figurine into a building. Now special note here, you have to roll enough on the dice so that your figure moves one more than the yellow squares so that it can move into the place that it's going to. For instance, if I roll to the chemist and I, I roll a four and just manage to get to the chemist, I would need to wait my turn and roll again in order to take the last step into the chemist. Once inside a building that you are looking for, you will turn to the back of the case card. Now on the back of the case card, each building that is on the board corresponds with a certain number. That is your clue that you will find in this particular building. So if I went to the chemist and look across here, it says number three. This is where the rulebook takes on a whole new purpose. This is not only a rulebook, but it has all of the clues for each case. And as you can see, there are lots of them. This page after page after page, you will look up number three, as we just did, and look up the clue given. This is where your solutions checklist comes in handy. You write down your clue, put it away, and hopefully keep your solutions checklist away from prying eyes. It is, after all, a race to see who can solve the case first. The players will make their way individually around the board, picking up clues as they go and trying to be the first person to solve the case. We talked a bit before about the Scotland Yard badge and the skeleton key. Now here's where the game can get pretty competitive. If a player moves into an area and picks up a clue, 
and it is a vital clue that they do not want the other players to get too easily, they can leave on that particular place a Scotland Yard badge. This means that the building has been sealed off by Scotland Yard and nobody else may enter. The player then leaves and another player may not enter unless they have a skeleton key in which to let themselves in. If they do, they place the skeleton key on top of the Scotland Yard badge and they both go back to their discard piles. How does that help when every player has one Scotland Yard badge and one skeleton key? Well, you can pick up more Scotland Yard badges and skeleton keys as you go through the game by simply stopping at either the Locksmith or Scotland Yard. Now, you can only have one of each at any time during the game. So if you already have a skeleton key and you're at the Locksmith, well, you don't get another key. However, the Locksmith and Scotland Yard building also have their own clues to the case that you're working on. So it is handy to plan out your turn so that you get to Scotland Yard and the Locksmith at a convenient time where you will also require a key or a Scotland Yard badge. These badges can seal off areas and slow players down immensely if they have already used up their skeleton key and need to get back to the locksmith and before they get into the building. Once you feel that you have enough clues and you are ready to solve the case, you must first make your way all the way back to 221B Baker Street, which turns the game into a pretty stiff race at this point. One thing that can help you in a place that we haven't talked about yet is the carriage depot. The carriage depot, like Scotland Yard and the locksmith, has multiple functions. Not only will you get a clue at the carriage depot relating to your case, but on your next turn, you may also take a cab from the carriage depot to any of the buildings on the board without it costing you a move. This is a handy way to get across the board early in the game and see clues that other players will take a long time to get to. Or if you're particularly devious, here's a handy shortcut that can get you back to Baker Street just before another player who is also ready to solve the case. Once you're back at 221B Baker Street, you can attempt to solve the case. Now you do this by matching up the evidence that you have acquired, for instance, the murderer, weapon, and motive, as we were looking for in case number one, and you will have written down on your solutions checklist with the solution section of this book. Now this is the one-time deal, because once you check the solution section, you will know. So the first thing to keep in mind is when you check this for the first time, you're reading it to yourself, not out loud to the group. You're looking for the three to five pieces of evidence that match your case number. Now you don't have to match these exactly. For instance, if someone used a gun and you've said a particular style of gun, which wasn't the exact style of gun that we used, it doesn't really matter. There are basically keywords in the back which say, stabbed with a knife, shot with a gun. As long as you have gun, knife, shot, stabbed, you have solved the case. If your clues do not match, then you are out of the game and may not tell anything that you have discovered to the other players. Once you have matched up your evidence correctly, you may read out loud the blurb that comes underneath the case number and will tell everyone the story about what happened and why. Then of course, you can gloat for being the first person to solve the case. And that is how you play 221B Baker Street. There are a couple of other tiny little housekeeping rules, such as your pieces are not allowed to move diagonally on these tiles. Also, there are areas like the dock and the park that have multiple entrances. So, your character can move into the park from, say, this side, check the clue, and in the next turn, you can leave from the other side of the park, skipping a big section of tiles as you go. And there you have it. You are ready to play 221B Baker Street, the Sherlock Holmes Master Detective game. Now, as I mentioned, there are a couple of different ways to play this game. The first and easiest one is to simply swap out playing individually as Sherlock Holmes against the other players at the table and form into teams. Now, this may seem very simple, but remember, you are collecting clues, some of which can be a little bit cryptic. So other people on your team may have a different interpretation of a particular clue and that can cause some conflict and creativity as the game goes on. For instance, a clue might mention some sort of shield that is worn. Now, some players may believe that that is leading them to the museum where artifacts like medieval shields and stuff might be found, whereas other players might point directly to Scotland Yard saying the shield is symbolic of the badge that Scotland Yard wears. And so the back and forth between players can be quite interesting and can lead to some teams being very successful very quickly or going completely down the wrong path. 
Now the other way to play this game is cooperatively, in which case there is only one Sherlock Holmes that needs to be on the board. Instead of moving around the board by rolling the dice, which doesn't need to happen because there is no longer a race, players simply decide together where they're looking to go in a given turn and the piece is moved directly there and the clue that corresponds is read straight away. The group then works together to sort out these clues. So how do you win this game? Well, the idea is that you solve the case with the least amount of clues possible, and there are actually rules in the rulebook for ranking how successful your group was. If you can solve the case, for instance, in 1-5 to five clues, you'll be ranked a master detective. However, if it takes 14 clues to solve your case, and there are only 14 buildings to visit, then you are dubbed a simple Watson. Harsh. So now you have the rules and the overview, and now we're going to talk about why you should play this game. Now I have done so a couple of times with some friends of mine, and what I really enjoy about this game is the fact that it's got all these different cases to work through. You're kind of like old school Sherlock Holmes from the book, sitting in 221B Baker Street and being brought these different cases which all have this strange twist to them, this mystery that you have to go through. There's a certain drive to get on with the next case. Personally, I find the cooperative or team-based play a little bit more interesting just because of the way some of those clues are written. One person can interpret them one way, another person completely different, and the arguments, discussions, and finding out who was right in the end is definitely worthwhile. So this game really has a lot of playability, whether you're into a long competitive evening with a lot of friends or quick arcade style play. So there you have it, thanks for joining us at Rules Are Fun. Subscribe to find out more rules for more games and to see us play through some of these games as soon as I can find enough friends to join me in doing it. It might be a while. your wits and cunning against a series of clues who's to see blah, 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 a who can find story that goes along with the case and at the bottom you will find nothing because nothing. as I mentioned there are a few other ways to play this game which I'll just look up now